For weeks now, we've been looking at a, the beginning of not the life of Elijah, but Elijah as he come onto the scene to us. Okay, in First Kings chapter seventeen, and if you know anything about the story of Elijah early on, he was he was called by the Lord God to make an announcement to King Ahab, who was surely, without a doubt, a wicked, wicked ruler. So wicked that Scripture says that he was more wicked than any other rulers before him. It's an amazing story. Ahab's wife was Jezebel, and she was... She wasn't any better and Elijah would go through this period of his life serving the Lord, faithful to the Lord, but yet at times doubting a lot, struggling a lot, but trying to keep his focus, his focus on the Lord God, trying to keep his focus on Him and as the threats would come down, as the, as the threats from, from Jezebel, from, from Ahab, from the enemy. It, 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 you can read the story. I'm not going to go through it again because we just we, we were, we've been in it so much and for the last several weeks. And it took us this morning to to First Kings chapter 19. And if and if you remember in First Kings chapter 19, Ahab has has fl- or Elijah has has fled to Sinai and he's tried to get away and. He's just tried to get away from everything. He's a lot of fear in his life. He was afraid and he, he flees for his life. Elijah did in verse 3 of 1 Kings chapter, chapter 19. And he, he finds himself under a tree, a solitary tree, a broom tree, if you will. And, and the Lord pretty much awakens him. He just, he just wants to disappear. And the Lord awakens him and tells him to pick up and move on eat and for 40 days and for 40 nights he'll travel to Mount Sinai the mountain of God and there he will come to a cave and there he'll spend much time there and in with the Lord and the Lord would pass by and from verse 11 to 13 of 1 Kings chapter 19 it, it talks about how he would go out and stand before me on the mountain and the Lord told him as Elijah stood there the Lord would pass by there would be a mighty windstorm that would pass by they would hit the mountain rocks would fall there would be a mighty earthquake and there would be a mighty fire but the Lord would be in none of that but the Lord then would come with a gentle whisper and Elijah would walk to the to the entrance of the cave and he would cover his face with his cloak and for he could not look on the face of his God, of his Lord. That's pretty rapid from 1 Kings 16 on through to 19. But if you don't know the story, please read it in your own time because it's an amazing story of a man of God who was, who was learning to, a prophet who was learning to grow in his faith. As I was looking through Psalms for a little bit, it, I come across Psalm 70, or Psalm, I'm sorry, 25, and it kind of, if you turn to Psalm 25 this evening, this is David's confidence in his prayer to the Lord God. If you've been in with us any amount of time as we've been going through Elijah, you can easily see how Elijah can be fit into part of Psalm 25. Not all of it, but some of it. Just like you and I can, can find our way in, in Scripture, not in that sense, what I'm talking about, it, or what, what some people would say when I make that statement, find a way in Scripture like you're part of Scripture. But no, in a sense of you, you, you can relate and, 
And here in Psalm 25, listen to what it says. And unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. It's to you, O Lord, I, I lift up my soul. It's to you. It's to you, O God, I give my life. It's to you I, I trust in you. My trust lies in you. As it was in David's life, so it was in Elijah's life. His trust, and so it is in your life, and so it is in my life. Our trust must solely be in Him, right? It must. It has to be. And here's David's confidence in his prayer to, to his God, to his Lord. And, and make no mistake about it, as, as at times in Elijah's life, where he seemed like he was just all over the place, there was many, many more times when the man was just solid in his faith. He was solid. Like it's all fear will creep in and find its place and... So it was in your life, so it is in mine, so it was in David's, so it was in Elijah's. Oh my God, in you do I trust. Oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Let me not, let me not trust in myself, but let me trust in you, O oh God. Do not let me be disgraced, is what he's saying. Or do not let my enemies rejoice in defeating me. If you go right back to Elijah's life that we, that we looked at for four weeks or five, whatever, that we looked at. Ahab hated Elijah. And Jezebel hated Elijah to the point that she says, if I have it my way by tomorrow morning, I will kill you, Elijah. I will kill you. It's the enemy, isn't it? The enemy of Elijah, the enemy of David, the enemy of us, the enemy of our souls. In Psalm 25, verse 2, David says, Oh my God, I, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. May my trust, may my trust be, be solely in you. May my, may my trust rest in you, O oh God. Elijah was learning that. That his trust must lie in his Lord and his God. It must. Sometimes we go through things in life where we don't understand, do we? We don't understand. In Elijah's life back in 1 Kings, he didn't understand a lot. Some, but a lot he didn't get. He didn't understand to the point where he just wanted to die. He said, Lord, just, just take me. I'm done. Just take me home. The Lord said, no. No. There's work still for you to do, Elijah. There's work still for you to do. There's a passage of Scripture in, in, in Proverbs chapter 3. It's very familiar. You've all heard it before. Read it before. Numerous times in your Christian walk, I'm sure. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with, with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge Him. And He will direct your paths. I'm going to read 1 Kings chapter 19 again, just 1 through 8. 
and listen, see, see what Elijah would have to do. When Ahab got home, verse 1, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah's fearful. He flees for his life. He goes to Bathsheba, a town in Judah, as he left a servant there, he went all alone into the wilderness. He traveled all day. He sat down under the tree. He prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. I'm reading through this pretty quickly. Then, I, then he laid down. He slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him, told him to get up and eat. He looked around. Beside his head was bread and baked Bread that was baked on hot stones in a jar of water. He ate and drank and laid back down again. Clearly a sign of depression. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more. The journey ahead of you will be too much for you, basically if you do not eat and drink. Elijah had to what? He was at a point in his life where he was physically, he was mentally exhausted. He had to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. To trust in the Lord with all his heart. To lean not on his own understanding. Elijah didn't get it. He didn't get it. He didn't get why all this was going on. He didn't get it. But he would get it one day. But at this point he did not get it. He didn't understand the Lord's ways. But we're commanded in all thy ways to acknowledge Him and He shall direct our paths. We're commanded even when we do what? Even when we do not understand. Even when we don't get life. Whatever comes our way. Even when we don't get it. Even when it makes no sense. You ever been there? When life makes no sense. That we need to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 to trust in Him with all of our heart. Meaning to, to for everything of us, to give it, just, just to give it to Him, to trust in Him, that whatever the outcome may be, whatever the situation may be, whatever's at the end of the road, He's completely in control. Nothing's gone haywire. It's going to, according to His plan in your life and in mine. For Elijah, 1 Kings 19, he's at the breaking point. All he wants to do is die. He basically says that in verse 4. I've had enough. I'm done. I'm done. You've been there. Maybe not to the point to where you said, I've had enough, I want to die. But you've been there to the point in service for Christ, in worship for Christ, and being a believer, spiritually speaking, to where you've come to the point, and, and in yourself, you say to yourself, or you might even say to Him, Lord, I don't understand, I can't take no more, I've had enough. I've had enough. Listen, I've never been to the level of Elijah. Never. Say, so how do you know? Because I might have had people get mad at me. But I've never had somebody stand up and say, listen, if I have it my way, you will not be breathing tomorrow. I've never been in Elijah's shoes. But I can see in Scripture to where his trust in the Lord would have to go Deep. Listen to what David says in Psalm 25. Back to there. Verse 2. Oh my God I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Indeed none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Indeed none of those who wait for you O oh God. Will be ashamed. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced. But disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. David says, let the disgrace come to those 
to those who are wicked. Let not the disgrace come to me. For Elijah, let the disgrace come to Ahab. Let the disgrace come to Jezebel. Oh God, let the disgrace come to your enemies. But do not let the disgrace come to me. May that be your will, O God. And listen to what David says in Psalm 25, verse 4. Show me thy paths, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Make me known your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Show me the way that you want me to go. I mean, Elijah said back in 1 Kings chapter 19, I mean, he was like, listen, I, I did everything you wanted me to do. I followed your path and he was done. And it's as if he needed a, a spiritual lift. Here, David, similar. Show me your path, O Lord. Show me your ways. Teach me. Your paths. In serving the Lord God, it's, it's not your way, it's His way. Okay? It's His way. In serving Him, it's, it's His way. Whether, whether you like it or not, it's, it's His way. Whether I like it or not, it's, it's His way. It's Him. Christ. At the conference last week, as I was speaking on Psalm chapter 1, we looked at Acts chapter 22, verse 10, or verse 1 through 10, just quickly. And this is in Acts 22 was when, was when the Apostle Paul was giving a defense of who he was in Acts 22. And listen to what he says in verse 10. And, and I said, what shall I do? This is, this is on his road to Damascus. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all the things which are appointed for you to do. I said this last week. During the conference, if you're not careful, you will quickly speak over, you'll quickly read over verse 10, where Paul says, and I said, what shall I do? You notice Paul says, what shall I do for you? Because this is about you, Lord. This is not about me. David in Psalm 25, show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. What shall I do for you, Lord? What shall I do? It's the same thing in your life and the same thing in mine. Listen, if you're not careful, you will find your life so consumed with things about you. And I say this all the time because I have to constantly re remind my own self that if I'm not careful... I will find it about me. And if I'm not careful, I will quickly find myself unteachable. Or one who cannot be corrected. Difficult believers to be around is, are, are these. Those who are unteachable and those who cannot be corrected. Extremely difficult to be around. You can't tell them nothing. They're unteachable. They know it all. You can't help them in correction. And not in a sense to where you're just running around judging everything they do. But you know what I'm saying. Help them and lead them, guide them in, in Scripture like we all should do one another. They, they, they won't even accept that. They're not teachable. They're not correctable. But here's a sign of one who's maturing in the Lord in Psalm 25, verse 4. 
Show me your ways, Lord. You teach me your paths. You teach me. Learn to be teachable. Learn to rest in Christ. Learn to rest in Scripture. No matter how difficult life seems to be, learn to rest in Him. In Him alone. No matter how difficult this week may be, if it is difficult for you coming up, rest in Him. Learn that. Elijah would learn that. Every, every single believer in the history of mankind has had to learn this. To rest in Christ. Everyone. And if they didn't learn it, if they struggled in learning it, well, they lived they just a complete, miserable life to the day they breathe their last, humanly speaking. In 25.5 it says this in Psalm, Lead me in thy truth, it says. Lead me in your truth and teach me. You're the God of my salvation. For you I, I wait all the day. All day long I've put my hope in, in you, O oh God. All day long it's you. My hope is in you. My trust is in you. Where's your hope and trust this evening? Where was your hope and trust last week? Where was your hope and trust two weeks ago? Where was your hope and trust a month ago? Personal questions always. But that's how Scripture is, isn't it? You read Scripture and as I've said many times in the past... What's it say? What's it mean? And how do I apply it back to my life? Back to my life personally. So where's your hope and your trust? Has it always been in Christ? Has it always been in the Lord Jesus? Has it always been in Him? Has it always been in who He is? Like we said about Elijah. Like we said about David. And so we say about Paul, each and every one went down the same learning road. The same one you and I must go down. To learn, to trust, to rest in the one who gave us our salvation. Lead me in the truth. Teach me, Lord. He says in verse 5, For you are the God of my salvation. You're the God of my salvation. We've read in the catechism this evening. Is there more than one God? There's only one God. The living and true God. There's only one God. That's the God of your salvation. Learn to trust in Him. Learn to keep from making things in your life little gods. There really are no God at all but there's a, because there's only one God. But learn to trust in the God of your salvation. Learn to wait on Him. It says in verse 5. Learn to wait on Him. See, back in Elijah's story, as we looked in Elijah's story, and especially in 1 Kings chapter 19, it seems like, I mean, I'm not knocking a guy one bit, but it seems like he got to the point to where he, he was, his trust, his waiting, the tank was running empty. We're no different. We're no different. It's something we must learn in our lives as we, as we serve Christ. Is to learn to trust in the one who's the God of our salvation. For it's Him 
in Him alone. The passage of Scripture in 27, 1 of Psalm says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He, the Lord, is the strength of my life. To whom? To whom shall I be what? Afraid, right? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who am I going to fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers come upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries, my enemies, they shall stumble and fall. Though a host will encamp against me, my heart will, will not fear. War may rise against me. In spite of all this, I will be confident. I'll be confident in who? I'll be confident in my God, my Lord. I'll be confident in Him. It's a little bit, Psalm 27, verse 1, just kind of reminds me a little bit of Elijah. He had to learn that the Lord is the, is the light, the salvation. Should he truly fear Ahab? Should he truly fear Jezebel? No. Why? Because the Lord is the defense of his life. Of Elijah's. Man is not to fear. Whom shall I dread? Man is not to fear. The one that man should fear is the Creator God. Him. For us, our fear is, is, a, is an awe. Is a respect as believers. But to those who do not believe, their fear should be one of trembling. Trembling. Fearfulness. Why? Because He holds their very life and the judgment that He, that he has is, is on them. And it's just a matter of time before He lets the judgment fall. I've always found it interesting that even the demons of hell tremble. Tremble at the thought of a holy God. But yet man, lost man, for many, many years and always been, many lost people mock and tremble not at a holy righteous God. Remember when Elijah come out of the cave back in 1 Kings chapter 19? As he couldn't even look upon the God of Israel, the Father. And he covers himself. He covers himself. He can't even look upon him. Why? Because he is so righteous. Elijah is nothing. It's the same thing for us. It's the same thing for you. It's the same thing for me. He is so righteous. And we are nothing. We're nothing. If it wasn't for Christ, we would not even come close to the entrance of heaven. But because of Christ, because of what He offers, eternal life and believing in Him, all that believe, all that believe, will one day stand, will one day stand, will one day rejoice at the Almighty One. 
but for those who do not believe. The fear they should have should be one of trembling. He says, you're the God of my salvation in verse 5 of Psalm 25. I'll wait on you all day. On you will I wait all day, he says. On you do I wait. On you, O oh Lord, do I wait. It's you. He says in verse 6, Remember, O oh Lord, your compassions and your unfailing love. Remember your compassion and failing love. In Elijah's life, I know we're speaking of David here, but in Elijah's life, there was much compassion by the Lord. Much compassion. Over and over and over and over again, there was, there was compassion and unfailing love in Elijah's life. By who? By the Lord God. Even when Elijah seemed to be at the very end, when he could not go no more, when he sends his servant away and he goes alone into the wilderness in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4, he sits down under the tree and he prays that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. He lays down and he sleeps under the broom tree. Even then, even then, as he was sleeping, an angel comes and touches him and says, Get up and eat. Compassion and love. Compassion and love. He looks around and, and laying beside him is, is some baked bread on hot stones and a jar of water. And he, The angel says, Elijah, get up. You must eat. It's compassion and love and care for one of the Lord's own. There's not a believer walking today, nor will there ever be, that the Lord God will ever fail. Never will be. Never will be. I don't care what you're going through in your life. I don't care what I go through in my life. We might question where he's at. We might say, where are you, Lord, in this situation? Where are you in that? But he will never fail us. His compassion goes on and on and on to his chosen children. It doesn't stop. Though we might not understand it, but it's there. We might not see it, but it's there. The angel touches him and tells him, get up and eat, Elijah. He looks around and beside his head is some baked bread and a jar of water. He eats and drinks and he lays back down again. He lays back down. He falls back asleep. Then the angel of the Lord comes again and touches him and says, get up and eat some more. The journey ahead will be too much for you. If you're not one for much compassion, you need to learn compassion as a believer. You see, some believers are, we're all wired differently, are we not? And the more you grow in your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, how do I learn more compassion? By, by growing in Christ more. By serving the Christ more. By learning more of Him. You know, one that comes to my mind is early on in his life was probably one guy who really didn't have much compassion. And we've talked about in the past in a different light, a different sense was, was Peter. I mean, the guy really didn't have much compassion early on. Did he? 
Not really much. But he would learn, would he not? Compassion. He would learn compassion and care for fellow believers. How did he get this? He would learn this through what? Christ. He would learn what true compassion was. He would learn what true care was through the one who saved his soul. That's where he would learn it. Through him. And him alone. And here you see with Elijah. Get up Elijah. The journey is going to be long Elijah. The journey is going to be long. You need to eat and drink more. You need enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai. Which is the mountain of God. There, there you will find your rest for a day or two. But you must learn. You must learn, Elijah, to rely solely on me and not on yourself. So too we all must must learn the same. To rely solely on Christ and not on self. To understand that as long as we live in this world, as long as we live in this body, as long as we are in this body, the struggle is real, isn't it? It's real. But we also must remind ourselves according to Scripture in Psalm 25.10 that all the paths of the Lord are, are, are merciful and true. And the truth. All the paths of Christ are that. All the paths of the Lord God are loving kindness or truth. To who? Where does the loving kindness go? Where does the truth go? Well, it goes to those. It goes to those who are His. It says at the end of verse 10 in Psalm 25. To those who keep His covenant. To those who keep His testimonies. To those who are His... Loving kindness and truth goes. To those that are His, mercy goes. To those that are His, grace goes. Amen. In Elijah's life, grace was there. In Elijah's life, mercy was there. In Elijah's life, truth was there. In Elijah's life, loving kindness was there. The world would say, if they read the early story of Elijah that we have in 1 Kings, the world would say, my goodness gracious, I mean, your supposed God just, just threw you to the wolves. That's how the world would say it. But oh, no, no. Our God is the one true God, as we said at the beginning of the service this evening and this morning. And he never throws his children to the enemy. He never does. He never throws them to the enemy. And remember also as we wind down this evening, as we look this morning in Elijah's life, and just when Elijah thought he was the only one, remember? Paul reminded us in Romans chapter 11, verse 2, 1 through 5 or 6, that, that the Lord God already had 7,000 set aside, already had men set aside, already had Eli Elisha waiting in the wings to help Elijah in his service for the Lord, the Creator. Of heaven and earth. So what do we take this evening? Take this. As Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says. Trust in the Lord your God with all thine heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't. 
Because your understanding is screwed up. And so is mine. And we, we, might, we might wrap it up in pretty neat paper and put a bow on it and make it look good. But it's not. Our understanding is a mess. May we rest in Him and may we trust in Him alone for who we are and our service for Him and our worship for, for Him, for His glory, for His glory alone. And not to listen to the ones of the world, but listen to what Scripture says because this is literally the voice of God speaking to us, Genesis to Revelation. It's literally that. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we love you and we, and we thank you for this time together this evening, Lord, as we, as we looked upon your word and for who you are, our God, our Lord. We thank you for your truth, for your mercy and your cares in our life. Lord, we thank you for the life of Elijah, Lord. What a story. What a remarkable story of an average man used by a, an amazing one God. What a story. May we learn from it, Lord. May we learn how you provided for Elijah. How you provided for David in just a little bit in Psalm 25 and how parts of it reminded us of Elijah. How you provide for us. Father God, you be glorified and you be honored. You be exalted. To you goes the glory and the honor and the praise forever and ever. Amen.